The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Charge induced in a ground plane by an overhead conductor illustrates the method of images and the superposition of fields due to line charges to satisfy boundary conditions. In practice, this circular conductor could be a high voltage power line, and this conducting ground plane could be the earth underneath. The potential between the conductor and the ground plane is that of two line charges, one just below the center of the conductor, and the other, its image symmetrically located below the ground plane. Here are these line charges, one just below the center of the conductor, and its image here below the ground plane. With the line charges at these positions, the equal potential surfaces are cylinders, including, as a limiting case, the x equals 0 symmetry plane. The value of A is just that which makes the cylinder of radius R an equal potential surface. We apply a voltage from this 100 hertz source to the circular conductor. The actual charges are induced on its surface in just such a way that every point has the same potential as the source. Similarly, charges are induced on the surface of the ground plane in just such a way as to make it have zero potential. We can measure the charge induced on the ground plane with this probe. The probe has a center section electrically insulating from the surrounding shield which contacts the ground plane. The surface charge density distribution on the ground plane is proportional to the normal component of the electric field. It is therefore proportional to the voltage of the cylinder. Conservation of charge requires that the probe current be the time rate of change of the charge on the probe surface. It follows that the voltage induced across the internal resistance of the scope is proportional to the rate of change of the applied voltage. The upper trace is the applied voltage. The lower one is that of the probe. Because the probe voltage is the time derivative of the applied voltage, the signals are 90 degrees out of phase. Our line charge potentials predict the probe voltage. Y is the location of the probe on the ground plane. Y measures the distance to the probe from the center line. This is the predicted distribution of normalized probe signal with normalized probe position. The signal is largest directly under the conductor, trailing off to zero as the probe is pulled away. As the probe is moved out from under the conductor, the lower scope trace shows the charge induced on its surface decreases. Let's make a quantitative comparison of what we predict and what we measure. For our experiment, the scope resistance is 1 megohm. 
the probe area is pi times 3 centimeters squared. The capacitance per unit length between the cylinder and the ground plane is calculated to be 23.8 picofarads per meter. The applied voltage is 10 volts peak, and the frequency is 100 hertz. A, the distance from the image charge to the ground plane, is calculated as 10.8 centimeters. Then V0, the voltage with the probe directly centered under the cylinder, is calculated as 1.25 millivolts peak. This compares to a measured value of about 1.15 millivolts peak. Our theory gives an absolute prediction to within 10%. This is consistent with sources of error, such as the finite probe area. To test the prediction of the shape of this distribution, we have taken these data points. So that the shapes can be compared, the probe voltages have been normalized to the value V0 measured at Y equals 0. In the analysis, it is assumed that the plane is grounded. Presumably, even the section of surface occupied by the probe is constrained to zero potential. In computing the current to the probe using this assumption and then finding the probe voltage, we are making an approximation that is valid only if the voltage is small. One way to ensure this is to make the resistance of the scope small. The scope resistance is one megohm. It may come as a surprise that such a resistance is treated here as a short circuit. However, at 100 hertz, the voltage is small enough. We can see our approximation get into trouble by raising the frequency. Our formula says that the voltage should be proportional to the frequency. As the frequency is raised from 100 hertz to 200 hertz, the voltage does indeed essentially double, as the equation suggests. Remember, the lower trace is the probe voltage. But as the frequency is raised from 500 to 1,000 hertz, the probe signal saturates. As the frequency is raised to this range, the voltage of the probe becomes large enough that it does begin to influence the field distribution. Some of the field lines that originally terminated on the electrode are diverted to the grounded part of the plane. Also, charges of opposite polarity are induced on the other side of the probe, between the probe and the ground plane underneath. The result is an output signal that no longer increases with frequency. A frequency response of the probe voltage that does not increase linearly with frequency is therefore telltale evidence that the resistance is too large or the frequency too high. Electric fields at low frequency do not penetrate the body. Provided a person is grounded, the hand effectively shields the probe. Our experiment illustrates how the potential of two line charges can be used to predict the surface charge induced on a conducting surface.